Welcome to the stage, Mary Thomas, Chief Operating Officer for the Spartanburg County Foundation and Robert Het Chapman III, Center for Philanthropy. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. Again, my name is Mary Thomas, Chief Operating Officer of the Spartanburg County Foundation and Executive Director of the Robert Het Chapman III Center for Philanthropy. I am so delighted today to serve as your moderator for this fireside chat, which is designed to be an informal, interactive, inspirational, and challenging conversation about the role philanthropy can play in addressing, and in maybe some cases, eradicating poverty in communities across America. This conversation will also discuss how poverty and race equity are at the intersection of one of America's greatest challenges. In most cases, you cannot talk about one without talking about the other. Are we proximate enough to the problem to understand the complexity of this challenge? That is the great divide between the haves and the have nots. What are the pathways that are necessary for economic mobility and success given the intentionality around systems designed to keep people right where they are? What is it about philanthropy or our current ecosystem that we must fix to bring relief to individuals we are called to serve? What strategy should we consider in our fight against poverty? These are some of the broad questions we will explore and consider over the next 40 minutes. And as time allows, we will invite you to submit your questions in the chat and we will respond as we are able. As we were planning for the conference and considering possible speakers to address this subject, we could not think of anyone more appropriate, more qualified, more inspirational than, you, than New York Times bestselling author of The Other West More and former president and CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, Wes Moore himself, to lead our conversation. Many of you have heard Wes Moore either at a conference or perhaps you have seen him interview news moguls like Tom Brokaw, or you have seen him interviewed on Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday, or perhaps you have received a text on a given Sunday morning when you're sleeping in to say, hey, wake up, there's Wes on MSNBC, or this morning when I was getting dressed, my nephew sent me a text message from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I have it right here. Good morning, auntie. Um, turn on CNBC Squawk Box. Wes Moore is coming on after the commercial break. <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> and we're so grateful that today he chose to be with us. And so we're going to be talking to him about his story of resilience. You know, his story is one that clearly demonstrates what happens when potential meets opportunity. He is beating the odds. Serving his country, he's done that. He's an author, a father, a husband, a son, a brother, and a friend to many. His first book, The Other West Moore, a perennial New York Times bestseller, captured the nation's attention on the fine line between success and failure in our communities and in, our, in, in ourselves. And I just learned that this book is going to be turned into a movie, and we're so excited about that coming up in the future and hopefully not too distant future. Other books include The Work, Discovering Wes Moore and This Way Home. His latest book, Five Days, explores the uprising in Baltimore in 2015 after the death of Freddie Gray in police custody through a kaleidoscope of perspectives and examines critical questions about the deeper causes of violence and poverty. There is so much more I could say about Wes, but our time, we would not have enough time to get to the subject. So I ask you to please go out and buy his book, Five Days. You will, you will not be uh, disappointed. So let's begin with this simple question. Wes, tell us, what is your why? And it's good to see you, my friend. What is your why? It is so good to see you. And and, and I, I, I have to tell you, Mary, I mean, it is always an honor to be in conversation with you, whether it is virtually or whether it is in person. Uh, you are truly just one of the most important and inspirational souls um, that I know. And I'm, uh, I'm grateful to call you a friend. And I am uh, I'm thankful for the chance to follow you anywhere that, uh, that you. you will lead us. So it, it's, it's great to be with you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, and, 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 and I think that my, my, my why 
is actually very deep rooted. Um, where, you know, I, I like to say I come from a long history of, 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 of teachers and preachers. You know, that's, that's my family. Uh, and, and I think about what it was for my grandfather, who was the first one in our family, on my mom's side of the family, um, who was actually born in the United States. Uh, you know, this was a, uh, you know, he was born, they were actually born down in South Carolina, as you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when he was just a toddler, the Ku Klux Klan ran him and my entire family out because my great grandfather was a minister and he was a vocal minister and a little bit too vocal. And so in the middle of the night, he picked his family up and they left, not just South Carolina, but they left the United States and they moved back to Jamaica where they're originally from. And they, and with a vow saying, I, I won't return back to that country. Uh, and most of my family actually did not, but my grandfather did. And my grandfather always felt this belief and had this belief of saying, you know, this was my birth home. No one has the right to run me out. And so eventually he came back to the United States. He went to Lincoln University and HBCU in Pennsylvania. He became the first black minister in the history of the Dutch Reformed Church. And this was a, this was a man who passed away at the age of 87. Uh, with a, and, and his whole life had a very deep and thick Jamaican accent. Uh, but he might have been the most American person that I've ever met. He might have loved this country more than anyone that I have ever had a chance to be around. And the why comes back to this idea of this ideal of this country. That this ideal of this country is in, in a land of opportunity where we all have a collective responsibility that as the history of this nation continues to evolve in turn, we have a collective responsibility to make sure that our fingerprints are on it. Um, my grandfather did that. My grandmother did that. My mom has done that. And I feel like it's part of part of the why is that it's it's our responsibility. It's our collective responsibility to make sure that the things that break our hearts uh, the things that God continues to call us to, the things that we know make our heart beat a little bit faster, that we have a collective responsibility, all of us who are the lucky ones, the blessed ones, the ones who are, 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 are woke up this morning uh, yeah. with an ability to do something that we can actually wake up this morning and actually do something. Uh, yeah. And that's our collective responsibility. Well, you know, Wes, you talk about being one of the lucky ones. As I was reading about your uh, your journey, your trajectory, growing up in Baltimore, and reading that at once once upon a time you you had handcuffs on your on your wrist at a young young age, uh, you it. ran away from school. Your mother, uh, whom a lot of us know, Joy Thomas Moore, Joy Thomas Moore, formerly with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and she worked there at the Council on Foundation for many years, running their films program. But your mother sent you to military school. <laughs> and she said, get your act together, young man. And you did. And look at you now. You, you, you found your way back to philanthropy. And that's pretty incredible. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about uh, your journey to the Robin Hood Foundation, one of the largest anti-poverty uh, foundations in the country, and yeah. particularly in New York. And, and what did you learn there? Help us, help us with that today. Well, you know, what, what's, what's amazing is, and, and this is why I think in so many ways, that, that entire era, uh, I kind of call it the lost era <laughs> for me, but, but that's actually the place where both philanthropy in general and Robin Hood specifically actually started touching my life in ways that I did not even appreciate at the time. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is this, is that, you know, uh, you know Robin Hood is a 32-year-old organization. It's an organization that, you know, was started by a, a, a group of a handful of people who eventually made the made the uh, you know, made the, the decision back in 1988. They thought that the markets would be bad. Uh, and they said, well, you know, we think the markets are going to be tough during 1988, which they ended up being. But they said, but you know who this year is really going to be hard on people who are already living in poverty. Because as we all know, oftentimes it's for those who are living in poverty. For those who are the most vulnerable in our society, they get hit first, they get hit hardest, and they get hit the longest. Mm -hmm. That's the way our society oftentimes has been structured. Right? And, and so they created this foundation called the Robin Hood Foundation that initially put together about and allocated about $40,000 and used data and metrics to be able to identify who are the organizations that do the best work, et cetera. Um, 
Now, 32 years later, the organization uh, has allocated north of $4 billion into the fight, working in education, housing, transportation, mental, physical health, anywhere where poverty, poverty is either the cause or the consequence, we will find, fund, and build if necessary in order to impact it. Um, the first piece why that era became so personal to me, though, in a way I didn't recognize was the first neighborhood that Robin Hood invested in was the neighborhood I was growing up in, in New York, literally. And I didn't know that until I actually ended up getting to Robin and became the CEO of Robin. And I started looking through all the history and the grants and everything. And I said, wait a second, that's my old neighborhood. Yeah. And so you realize it was, a, it was an organization that was making an investment in me and my family before I even knew what it was. The second piece, though, is also very personal. Because my mother, when my father died, that was, you know, I, as difficult as I thought it was on me or my older sister, my younger sister. The person who really had it toughest was my mom because now she was going to be a widow with three children she was going to raise on her own. And that was not the life that she prepared for, not the life that she expected. It was not the life that she dreamed of. And, uh, but it was her life. And this is a, a, a woman who had a master's degree and worked a series of part-time jobs until I was 14. Something happened when I was 14 years old. My mother got her first job that gave her benefits. My mother got her first job that allowed her to work one job instead of multiple jobs. My mother got a job that gave her reliable hours. That job was at the a &E Casey Foundation. First job that actually gave her benefits. And what we didn't realize at the time was that the job didn't just change her life, it changed all of our lives. Each and every one of her children benefited from that job. And so this idea, so philanthropy was something that had a distinct and an important impact on my life early, both in terms of how it personally, how we personally benefited from philanthropy in our neighborhoods, et cetera, but also from our own personal life was the fact that it was that role, that job in the foundation world that ended up altering how we moved and maneuvered and what our trajectory was as a family and in just a, an incredibly powerful way. So, so when you landed this job at, at, as CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, you, you brought with you all of your life experiences, uh, lived experiences, coupled with an enormous amount of, of resources to make a difference. And, and I'm curious, um, as we talk about this, um, you rely heavily on data. You rely very heavily on data there. And, and there's something you call poverty tracker. Yes. There were these various reports that you used in partnership with Columbia University. Would you talk to us, uh, the philanthropists in the room today, about the importance of, of data, serious data to help us understand poverty, number one, but two, how do we apply uh, the resources we have, financial and otherwise, to really uh, address poverty in a way that gets to the root causes, because there's something else you said, um, and it was uh, it was about the, the, uh, something to the extent of tolerating. Um, how do we tolerate poverty? It's almost like we've gotten comfortable with the tolerance of it. So, would you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, one of the first things we wanted to do when we got to Robin Hood is is it actually alter our mission. Right. And not all to the mission in terms of fighting poverty, but it is just on this idea. I think sometimes people delve into this, this concept of poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that is. Right. Because poverty is not something that should be tolerable. Like our job is not to make poverty more tolerable on people. Mm -hmm. Our job is not to make poverty easier on people. Our job is to end it because it's unnecessary and it's inhumane. And it shows itself in every single way that when people say, well, how does poverty, is it, is it, should we focus on education? Should we focus on housing? Should we focus on transportation? Should we focus on mental health? Should we focus on criminal justice reform? The answer is yes, because poverty does not pick and choose the way it introduces itself to individual families and individual people. Poverty is like, you know, the best description I can think of poverty is water. That when water floods in, water doesn't say, okay, I'm going to go left or I'm going to go right. Poverty finds every, I mean, water finds every hole mm -hmm. and it infects it and it penetrates it and it leaves rot and mold and destruction. That's what water does when it floods in. 
And so when we think about it from that perspective, that's how poverty is. That poverty shows itself in the air we are breathing, in the water we are drinking, in the schools we are attending, in the transportation assets that we have or don't have, in the way we're policed. I mean, poverty shows itself in every single way. And so when we talk about the importance of data, and I'm a very data-driven leader. I like mm-hmm. I, I am I have more of a quantitative mind than a qualitative mind. Numbers are much harder, I mean words are much harder to come to me than numbers are. Um and the thing that I know is this: it's important that we use data to be able to identify what it is and where it is that we go, how we measure our success. I'm a big believer in the idea that what gets measured actually matters and what matters actually gets measured. I'm also a big believer in this is that if you're going to follow the data, follow it where no matter where it goes. Mm-hmm. And don't pick and choose. And you're also a big believer that if you're gonna follow the data and make an investment, that you're gonna follow those families for a, a period of time. That's exactly right. And, yeah, and, and, and you don't just make that charitable gift, but you, you, you are looking for impact. Would you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And, and one of the things we wanted to see even with the poverty tracker, so the poverty tracker really is a research, it's a research tool that we use to really have and analyze the data, that it takes a look at, it takes a, it has a longitudinal data set of 4,000 families who we, who we then follow to look at what are the trend lines that we're seeing in terms of their pathways out of poverty, and then what are the lessons learned we need to take on that. It was really through the poverty tracker that we were able to understand that, at, that over the, and this was before COVID, that mm-hmm. over a four-year period before COVID, that half of New York families lived in poverty for at least a year over the past four years, half. And that's not half of a borough, that's not half of a, of a demographic, it's half of the city lived in poverty for at least a year over a four-year period. It also went to show us the, 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 the interconnection of race and poverty, how you cannot separate those two things because race still is the leading, is, is the predominant indicator of life outcomes. Whether you're talking about uh, income and wealth and health and, 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 and collegiate attainment and, and maternal mortality, literally, if you disaggregate the data, race is the thing that continues to show itself as a predominant factor. And so that's all things that the poverty tracker continues to lead. And then what we then had to be able to do is both as an organization and then both asking the field to then say, let's follow the data. These are not emotive splurges. These are numbers. This is data. And if we follow the data, we're then going to do a better job of being able to get us to the answers that we are all searching for. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk a little bit more more about responsibility. Uh, You know, it's easy to point the finger to the government or to the private sector uh, or and even to the nonprofit philanthropic sector. Uh, But in your opinion, how do we all come together? How do we come together as a community of, of citizens, of Americans, to care about those who are least among us. I mean, what is your strategy? What is your bold strategy? Uh, I heard you say in your office, and I kind of, you know, I don't know what I did, but you said, uh, we're going to eradicate poverty. And I had the nerve to quote a scripture by saying, well, the scripture says the poor is going to be with us always. But, and that was counterproductive to what your goal is. So help, help us with that. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, and 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 I and I think about I, I think about that as well because I know do when I when we tell people we say like listen poverty doesn't have to you know exist in terms of that that financial sense mm-hmm. um, and and people say to your point they're like well in the in, in in the book it talks about how poverty is something that is as old as mm-hmm. history and something that is with us and I say right but I also know uh, you know if we look at if we look at the if we look at the book and you look at you know Mark five. You know, it talks about how, you know, the poor will lead us. Mm -hmm. How do we change and redefine this definition? And so the idea for us when we're looking at how do you move people out of poverty, that it's not even just the financial. You know, there's there's a financial component, which is we are we are we are bent on moving people 200 percent above the supplemental poverty measure. Right. And that's that's the quantitative side. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's also about power. It's about autonomy. It's about freedom of your space and something that oftentimes for people who are living in poverty, there's a forfeiting of those things, of their power. 
of their autonomy. It's the same thing when, uh, you know, one of the things we built out during the COVID-19 crisis was, you know, we built out a power, uh, our, our relief fund, which is only the third time in the history of the organization we've activated a relief fund. Uh, once was after 9-11, I think again after Hurricane Sandy, and then after, after COVID-19, where we allocated over $80 million dollars. Uh, to our communities and community partners. Much of that capital went towards cash assistance, mm -hmm. just getting people capital. And, and when people said, well, you know, where, uh, well, how are people going to use it? How are people going to use that money? Once again, even the argument struck immediately to the heart of the idea of power and autonomy. Mm -hmm. That somehow uh, we, 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 want, we want continued verification when you're asking a person living in poverty to continue reminding me how much in poverty you are. Mm -hmm. And by the way, as we're trying to come up with ways and mechanisms to be able to support it, continue telling me and explaining to me how exactly you're going to use that capital. Knowing the fact that that capital, whether it was going towards, whether it's going towards diapers and pampers, whether it was going towards rent that was, that was overdue, whether it was simply going towards, I'd like to take my family to a movie. Mm -hmm. That these are just basic human things that we have to be able to give a sense of power and autonomy to people. And so when we think about what it means kind of in that, in that space, and what it meant in that in that moment. Really, it was about how are we willing to go through a process of power sharing with other people, you know, where we actually instituted for the first time in the history of the organization uh, a participatory grant making process. And basically what that is, is, is that, you know, we were saying if we're having all the experts uh, who are giving out the grants, who are, at, you know, giving out our, our resources, who are the experts? Are they, they can be the people with the PhDs and write the white papers, yes. They can be people, part of our teams and our staffs who are vetted and part of, you know, longtime members of, of our organization. Yes. Mm -hmm. But also, if you're not including impacted populations, do you really have experts? Because the people who are closest to the challenge are oftentimes the ones who are closest to the solutions. They're just hardly ever at the table. Mm -hmm. And so how do we then think and rethink a frame? on who it is that actually needs to be there. And I remember, Mayor, I remember I went to my old school that kicked me out um, back when I was 11 or no, they kicked, no, they kicked me out when I was 12. And they asked me to be the graduation speaker uh, this about four or five years back, which I thought was hilarious. I was like, you all know that this did not end well for me <laughs> or for you. And they're like, no, we get it. But we figured enough time has passed, we're gonna invite you back to campus. And I remember that the, the new principal of the school uh, we had lunch after uh, I gave the graduation speech and he, and he said to me, he said, what could we have done in order to help you with your experience there? Because it didn't end well. Yeah. And I thought yeah. about it and I said, and I said, I wish you would have made me part of a conversation instead of just the subject of a conversation. Yeah. 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 Because you never ever asked me what was going on. You never asked me what was going on. I said, if you would have asked me, I might've actually told you. But it's important that we make the impacted population part of a conversation and not simply the subject of a conversation. Wow, that's powerful, Wes. You know, um, there's there's a theory out there, and perhaps you've heard of it. I'm sure most folks in the audience have passing gear philanthropy, which explores the four traditions of philanthropy, one being charity. Uh, you know, then you have relief, you have improve, advocate and um and, and most folks fall in that charity um, tradition, if you will. But if we're truly going to get to um, eradicating or even having some movement and getting people out of poverty to some sort of economic mobility, we've got to get into that reform area where we're dismantling structures that perpetuate these problems. Would you talk to us a little bit about uh, that area and, 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 and why it's necessary for us to to really be looking at policy and systems change and, and doing the dirty work that it's going to take um, to, to turn this situation around for our country. I, I think about how one of my favorite stories is, is the starfish story. And it's that story about the starfish, about the young person who picks up a starfish and throws it in the water, it picks up starfish, throws it in the water, and there's thousands of starfish on the beach. And then someone comes up to the young, young person and says, you know, there are thousands of starfish on this beach. Do you really think you're making a difference by picking them up and throwing them back in? And the young person reaches down, and picks up a starfish and throws a starfish in the water. And they say, it did for that one. 
And it's a beautiful story, right? It's a beautiful story about how we can individually impact the world and specifically individually impact the involvement and the impact on one on one individual starfish, right? The, the, the thing that I've always gotten though about that story, and this goes back to the heart of your great question, is mm-hmm. but at what point are we going to ask why there are thousands of starfish in the beach? Like at what point are we actually going to ask that question? Why are there so many starfish? And, 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 and we can't, we cannot lull ourselves into this sense of comfort that somehow individual good deeds alone are going to lead us out of darkness. We have to be able to attack systems that continue to make success so extraordinary. And, and so when I think about that, it was one of the first things we wanted to incorporate with Robinhood where you know, uh, in my time there during the first time in the history of the organization, we built out a policy wing in our organization. And I, cause I, I didn't under, you know, one thing I frankly didn't understand was like, how can we be a poverty fighting organization if we're not willing to wrestle why poverty exists in the first place? Mm-hmm. Poverty exists because of policies. We continue to have policies that put people and keep people in poverty. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be able to develop a policy arm, a policy strength to be able to identify and go after and attack those things that continue making our work so necessary. Yeah. And so this became something that had to become a core fixture and a core feature of our work mm-hmm. where we had to have the ability to say, you know, if you look at something like the child tax credit, which we got involved in and, and you know, essentially making the adjustment to the child tax credit to make it fully refundable, that little adjustment that we fought for for over a year has essentially that was now what that was included in the in the American Rescue Plan in the ARP of making it saying that, you know, right now we have a child tax credit that was leading out 27 million children. So basically you have 27 million children who are being left out of a child tax credit because they were too deep into poverty, which makes no sense. Yeah. That basic adjustment that was made in the ARP has essentially cut child poverty in half in this country. So when people say things like, well, poverty is a choice. My answer is, you know what? You're right. It is a choice. But it's not the choice of the individual who faces the weight of poverty. It's society's choice. It's how much pain are we willing to tolerate in our neighbors? Mm -hmm. And so this is the type of thing where I feel like as organizations of, of power, of organizations of capital, of organizations of influence, that part of our influence and our capital cannot just simply be about, it should be about partially taking care of the need as we see it right now. Right. Right. That is our not just our fiduciary responsibility, that's our human responsibility. Right. However, it does also mean using your power and your influence to attack why we have those problems in the first place. And knowing that our collective voice can move mountains in that way. And, you know, you just you just uh, stepped on something there. Step, that's how we say it in South Carolina. You just stepped on something <laughs> there. <laughs> but listen, so. You know, some of us may not be able to raise 30 or 50 million dollars in 30 minutes. Uh, that's our financial capital. But talk, we have more capitals. We have the more, our moral capital, our reputational capital, intellectual capital, our social capital. Would you share with our audience today how really we have no excuse for not doing this work, regardless of the assets that we have? How can we uh, employ all of the capitals at our disposal to do what is necessary to move these families forward. Yes, that, that our, our, our power is, uh, is not just in our purse. Our power is in our voice. Mm-hmm. Our power is in our voice and the fact that as we step up and say X, Y, or Z is important, people will pay attention because you said it. That's mm-hmm. power. That mm-hmm. matters. And, and, and the truth is, is that none of us, not a single one of our organizations, even not one of our organizations combined, have the capital to be able to solve the problems on our own. Right? The reason that we are dealing with issues of housing insecurity, food insecurity, uh, 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 lack of educational uh, attainment and job skilling and job retraining, mental health and you know, criminal justice, all these other things. The reason we have these issues is not because philanthropy and foundations haven't done their job. Oftentimes, what we have philanthropy doing is filling in the holes of other breakdowns that exist. I mean, the reason that we have foundations and organizations that focus on food insecurity is because we have millions of people who are food insecure. Mm -hmm. The reason that we have organizations that focus on housing insecurity is because we have millions of people who are housing insecure. 
And so there's a re there our existence relies on the fact that there is a problem that is not of our making, but that we feel a responsibility and an obligation to be able to feel like we can we are part of the solving. Mm -hmm. As we think about that, and as we think about what that means, and understanding the size of the budgets that we are talking about, you take a look at the Department of Education in New York City alone, for example. The Department of Education budget in New York City alone is $27 billion. Uh, there is not a single foundation of philanthropy that can say, oh, we can match what that is. We can't. Our responsibility is to work in partnership with our governmental partners to be able to be our best practices that we can then turn around and share information, share data, share things that are working with our governmental partners, and then have our governmental partners then take these best ideas and bring them to a scale. Take these concepts and say, well, if we are to take the research of A, B, or C, if we are to take the good work of X, Y, or Z, if we are to say, well, this organization's been doing the thing we've been trying to solve for the past 15 years, and they've been doing it with 300 people, well, what happens if we could put our weight behind it? And how do you turn that 300 into 300,000 people that could be served on an initiative? That's our power. And so it's not just about our purse. It is also about our voice. That's a great point. And I think that's a great stopping point for us at this moment. Uh, I want to check in to see if there are any questions in the chat. We have about nine minutes left, and we do want to invite our audience to ask a question if they have one in the chat. And I don't, um, I don't have anything on my screen, so I will ask the next, the next question. Um, and you know, we've been talking about some heavy, heavy subject matter here uh, for the last thirty plus minutes in terms of poverty and the enormity of poverty. But I want you to lift us up a little bit now, because you're certainly an insp you're an informational guy. You've got a lot of knowledge, but you have a lot of inspiration and. And many of us are in this work, uh, we're all in, as they would say at Clemson University, They're all, we're all in. But at the same time, it gets to be exhausting. Talk to us about what inspires you uh, to continue to persevere despite um, the obstacles that we have to, we have to address. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like I have... Uh, I have a vice grip of information, of, of inspiration. And what I say is that that vice grip kind of comes from both sides. Uh, on this side, that vice grip is, uh, is my family and our legacy and our people and our history where I feel like you think about the history of each and every one of our families and you think of the history of each and every one of our cultures. I think as an African-American, you know, I, 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 I sometimes when people say, you know, how tough these, you know, this, this time is and this period is in our history, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not minimizing it all. Um, but I just think about what would a conversation like be one day with Harriet Tubman and explain to her how tough 2020 was? Mm -hmm. What would that conversation be like? Yeah, uh, I'd love to one day have a conversation with Paul Robeson and explain to him about the difficulty of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the reason we're still here is because we had people who were willing to not stop fighting and were willing to fight for a promise of tomorrow that they knew they wouldn't even see. Mm -hmm. And there's a beauty of that, that that's the right side. That's the that's the inspiration where you feel that we are here because there are people pushing. The left side for me is our children. It's the fact that there are not just my children. I have a, 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 a beautiful and wonderful 10-year-old daughter and a beautiful and wonderful 7-year-old uh, son. It's not just their future. It's the future of all of our kids and their kids eventually. Where I think this is a moment where people are going to ask, well, in this time, what did you do? How did you fight? How did you lead or did you lead? Yeah. And I think that there is this mutual vice grip of inspiration that I get where I feel like we're being looked at from above and we're being looked at from below. And that then keeps us straight. That mm -hmm. keeps us focused 
on the type of work we have to get done right now for the fact that is uh you know is in in the in the, in the, in the words of the good book where where you know Moses led us this far and then had mm-hmm. to pass the baton on to Joshua and then it was Joshua's job to keep pushing forward well that's mm-hmm. where I feel like we are right now yeah where we have mm-hmm. the baton in our hands and we will be we are being judged by those who came before about what we did and we will be we're being looked at by those who are in the future to ask us what will we do and i feel like those two things simultaneously serve as a measure of inspiration as to the fact that we cannot let this moment pass we cannot wait in order to get done what we need to get done that's awesome truly incredible We have a question here. How can we accelerate progress? How might you envision us leapfrogging ahead on these challenges, especially given the divides and and chasms in our society? Mm. It's a great question. Um, So I I think there's two things we have to do. One is we have to understand you're going to have to bring everyone on board. You are not going to. I I, I tell people, like, I'm good at math. Um, And I don't understand how you get addition through division. I don't understand it. We are going to have to find ways of bringing people together and bringing people together with a collective vision as to what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Understanding it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take compromise. It's going to take hard work. And it's going to take everybody understanding that we're all not going to win here. And that's okay. But what we have to do is if we can come up with a way of increasing opportunity for everybody, that is the closest thing we're going to get to where everybody will feel a long term win because it's what it's what's going to make our society stronger. The second thing I'd say, though, is you've got to start benchmarking success. You've got to start. Actually, you've got to put metrics behind it. You know, I remember having a conversation with a um, with a CEO once. And he was talking about, he was, you know, this was after the, the murder of, of Mr. George Floyd. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get my board to understand these issues and understand, you know, bias. And he said, you know, I haven't, I haven't brought in someone to speak to my board uh, about their book called Bias. He's like, so, I, you know, so I'm doing this. I'm trying to get my board on this journey. And he said, what else do you think I should do? And I said, my question, my question back to him was, what do you and your board talk about at every board meeting? Right. You talk about your assets and your liabilities. You talk about your new product lines. You talk about the, you know, if you're dealing with a lawsuit, where are the lawsuits, right? You're, you're, that's the thing you talk about at every board meeting. Do you talk about that? Because if not, I'm glad that you brought in a person to talk about their book bias to your board. But frankly, it's nothing more than a book report. Do you talk about it all the time? Do you measure yourself on it? Do you say these are the benchmarks we're going to have to hit if we're going to get better and hold yourself to it? You know, if you don't hit revenue targets, you're held to it. If your margins don't increase, you're held to it. And so if we're not coming up with ways of actually holding ourselves to account on things that we think are important. Then we're doing nothing more than 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 making, you know, making declarations. And maybe at times almost, you know, seeming that these things are important, but to the people who are listening and hear it once and never hear it again, it it, it will come off as performative. Mm -hmm. And so we have to then really be thoughtful about what it is that we're measuring and what are things we're hoping to accomplish and how do we then make that part of our ethos and part of the culture in the things we're actually trying to accomplish as an organization. Wow. You know, one of the things that I think those of us who know you um, respect most is that you always remember where you came from. And there was something that you wrote in your book, The Other West More, and you also hinted uh, about this in your book, Five Days. And and it says in your book, The Other West More, you said something that stuck with me. And uh, you said the chilling truth is that his story could have been mine. The tragedy is that my story could have been his. So it's so close but yet so far away. And as, as we come up on the end of our time here today, I'd like to know, and I'd like for you to share with our group, uh, what does this mean? What does that, st- that statement mean and, and the relevance of how we approach people uh, and, and we're trying to change lives and, and the power that we have as philanthropists to really leave our legacy. I'd like for you to end in, in our fireside chat today with your thoughts on that, on that particular statement and maybe a challenge to us today 
uh, to use our power to advance um, the American dream, regardless of where we live, um, you know, who we love, all of the things that we care about. I just want to turn it over to you at this point to close us out. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that statement means a lot to me because it, I think it was one of the things that I really took away from our relationship with Wes, um, where I, I looked at the distinct reality that here was a person who in many ways, I, I would argue, is just as talented. He's gregarious. He's funny. He's interesting. He's interested. Um, and he's now in year 20 of his life sentence. And I can't help but look at my own journey and think that, you know, did faith play a role? Absolutely. Did family play a role? Absolutely. Did, did um, education play a role? Absolutely. Um, did hard work play a role? Yes. So did luck. So did luck. And luck should not be a prerequisite. Luck should not have to be something that everybody must have in order to successfully navigate this thing called life. Uh, we as a society can be better than that. And we as a society have to understand that it's not even just, there's a huge, there's, there's not even just a financial toll to the measures of inequality that we see within our society. There's a human toll. That's something that eats at our soul when we can allow that, when we can see it and not have it move us. And so I, uh, I, I think about that line where I say the chilling truth is that his story could have been mine. The tragedy is that my story could have been his. It just serves as a distinct reminder to me that we have a larger obligation to be able to make sure that the individual success stories that we see do not have to be individual success stories, that they can become rules, that they can become standards in a way that they're not right now. But if we choose if we really choose, it's something we can actually get done. Well, Wes, this has been a rich, um, most ins inspirational, informative, challenging fireside chat without the fire, but the fire is in our belly to continue to do this work <laughs> and give it all we got to make America strong and, and make it better than the way we found it. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we wish you well in all of your future pursuits. Be, be well. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.